I don't know. I don't Second warning. Come on, Mary. Hey, boss. <laughs> there we are. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Thank right. you for being here. Uh, it's a six on a Thursday, and it's kind of muggy, but it's beautiful outside. You don't have to be here. I very much appreciate it. Um, and as well for the folks online, I can't see you, but thank you for being here. Um, so this is being recorded. So any slanderous things you want to say, wait, I will turn it off and then you can say it after. <laughs> um, just before we jump in, a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the building, around the corner, bathrooms, you have to take a phone call, make a phone call, use a restroom, whatever. Please feel free to get away. I don't want, this is not that rigid. I want to run through it. You do what you have to do. Turn our phones off. That was my next thing. Thank you, Ann. If you have phones, don't know anyone who doesn't, um, please either silence it or turn it off. Uh, please. There's one person that does. Oh, you, well, fantastic. Then you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> Ignore me. Um, the last thing is, uh, oh, paper, there's paper in front of you and pens. So we're going to be doing a couple of group exercises uh, or a group exercise, an individual one throughout this. And that's for those two things. Also, if you have questions, please save them for the end. Uh, in the interest of time, I want to respect, again, that this is a Thursday, the first week of school, which is why there aren't a lot of parents with young kids here then at um, so please take notes, take any questions you have. We'll try to answer them. If we don't get to them, I'm going to be collecting all of these at the end, and I will get back to you. So if you have a question, it would be helpful if you put an email or something down so that I can actually respond to the question you have, okay? Uh, I think that is it. Yeah, great. Oh, sorry, snacks and water. Um, please help yourself. That, huh? Yeah, for sure. It's glucose, so you're probably going to have a spike and crash, but just keep eating it, and then you'll stay pretty high, okay? Um, so yeah, feel free to anytime you want some water. It's again a little muggy, so help yourself. With that, we're going to jump in. We have a lot to cover. Uh, we have two hours to do it. Um, I'm very pleased to have. Well, it walks Chris Still, and he's going to be talking with us a little bit later, uh, as well as one of community housing is here to talk with us a little bit about their experience. So, quickly, objectives tonight. Got a few of them. One uh, provides some base education for a couple of things. 
where we are with regard to housing, where we have been, uh, and sort of high level how we got here. Um, I know there's a lot of general consensus. I haven't yet to hear somebody say we don't need new housing. That hasn't been a thing yet. Um, but there is some consensus that we do. Uh, and I think it's helpful to understand why. And actually, Cook County is a little bit unique in a couple of ways, and I'll get into that a little later. Uh, second, we're going to unpack very high level the needs analysis that was done. The EDA Commission did. It was published July 2nd, I think. Uh, you may have seen it, read about it. Um, we're going to go just over the high cliff notes, what they say that we think they think we need, like the projection of absorption through 2026. We're going to cover uh, the current construction challenges, and I'm going to do a little bit of that, framing of that, but then I'm going to have Chris and, and one Ruth really talk about it because they're the folks doing the building. I just try to help them do it. Uh, and then lastly, gather some feedback. Like I said, we have those uh, two exercises we're going to do. And part of this, so I have several board members here. Thank you, board. Uh, part of the reason for doing this is because we want to basically provide a data dump and then get feedback to understand. Now that you have some context, what do you think? Uh, I understand that there have been several housing summits in the past. This is a little different. We don't have the Minnesota Housing Partners and the other wonderful agencies here because we know the problem. We need more housing. We need lots of different kinds of it, right? So this is more a conversation about knowing that here's some specific needs and what do people think about housing in the future. Okay, we're going to jump in. Hi. Yes. Thank you. I'm just going to ask people to pass this around and give us their name and their phone number and their email. So. Oh. oh, great. Yes. Everybody's got a pen. Okay. Yep. Mary Sonnes, chair of the board. Thank you, Mary. Hi, everyone. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry. Boring stuff. Who's this guy? Um, sorry. I'm Jason Hale. I'm the executive director of the Cook County Trail. Obviously, sorry about that. Um, I think I know most people in here. So uh, this is the boring stuff. It's in Greek tradition. Tradition, you're supposed to create something called ethos. This is my attempt at creating credibility. Um, I've had a little bit of experience in various elements of real estate and housing for about 12 years, which has been a circuitous path, which has brought me here, which I'm delighted to be here. More interesting stuff, um, I've been able to work on a variety of housing projects, especially in my last role. Uh, and I've worked with Jeff and, and one roof, the company for uh, several years in Duluth. Uh, I worked with the Duluth HRA, the City of Duluth, and the Duluth EDA, all of the acronyms and authorities. Um, I was able to work on a little over a thousand different units in various various forms. Uh, my time at Duluth, uh, and you can see the photos on the screen here, just to give you an idea. Everything from tiny houses to uh, you know 150 plus unit apartments. So um, that has been a tremendous learning experience for me. Uh, was able to work on some uh, programs creation in Duluth uh, rehab, uh, well, rehab some rehab programs or the HRA have, uh, and as well. The last thing I like to mention, actually, my wife is in the back because she's bored today, I guess. I appreciate you being here. Um, <laughs> we have uh, we've closed out our eighth house in Lutzen uh, since we've been married for nine years. Last few years, last week was our anniversary. Nine, nine, nine. <laughs> she doesn't know either. Great. <laughs> Great cast. Nine ish years. Um, and uh, the reason I mention it is because if you, if you feel like your relationship and your partner and your stagnant or bored and you want a challenge, renovate a house together while we live in it. Uh, if you want to stay married or with your partner, don't do seven of them. That's just my unsolicited <laughs> advice. Uh, I think we could go through most things now. It's been, uh, I think we're like, you know what? Swatch, you pick it up. Don't care. It's fine. Uh, so housing has been a part of my life professionally and personally for a long time. That's all that to say. Okay, HRA. This is the mission statement of the HRA. Every organization has a mission statement if you're following the rules of business. Um, I just want to read it because I think it sets the tone for tonight. The Housing Redevelopment Authority of Cook County catalyzes, it advocates for the creation of safe, stable, and attainable housing opportunities for current and future residents. And there are two things I want to highlight. One, we used attainable on purpose. <clears throat> affordable can be uh, misconstrued, and in the uh, housing industry, affordable has actual parameters around it, and so you talk to different partners and that means different things. So attainable, we feel, is, captures what we're trying to say to make sure people can afford and to live and work here. Current and future, Cook County, I'm exhibit A, Cook County has experienced, uh, especially in the last 10 years or so, transition where there are people moving here um, from outside, historically outside the community. And we've seen that in housing stock, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. But the point is, we want to make sure the people who live here can afford to live and stay here, and the people who want to be here and invest in the community can also do that. So one big community with people who have long roots here, respecting that, and then people who really value what Cook County is. Okay. Why is there an HRA? Well, for those of you who didn't know, uh, there wasn't one until pretty recently. 
Uh, it was established last year, and then uh, the board was appointed in November. I started in the end of April. The reason is because, depending on who you ask, there's been a housing problem in Cook County from 30 to 100 years. I've heard that. <laughs> uh, and I said, oh, okay, better late than never. Um, so the other thing is, and actually Chris just walked out. It's kind of funny, Tenny. Uh, I'm not blaming the private market, uh, but it is clear that the private market cannot deliver and has not been able to deliver what we need. That is not any sort of diss or insult, it's just math. Um, and because of the contractor base here, there are more reasonable and intelligent business decisions to make usually than the type of housing we need in the county, okay? Again, not a problem, that's just a reality. And that's why we're all here. I wouldn't have a job if that wasn't the case, if the private market could do it. Finally, uh, again, the HRA was established by resolution, county board uh, uh, approved the establishment last year. And here we are on a beautiful muggy, muggy. I moved up here and they said, it's like, wear your parka all the time. This has been an incredible summer. I'm not complaining. I'm just, flannel is a bad idea. Okay, getting into the details here. Cook County, there are just shy of 15,000 parcels. Okay. Um, I'm not gonna, oh, I'm breaking on a couple of these slides. I'm breaking the cardinal rule of business school. You're not supposed to put a lot of text on slides. I'm acknowledging that. I'm doing it so when they're made available, people can go back and look at the slides. I'm not going to read through everything. So have no fear. Um, but you can ignore me and read if you want to. So uh, there are two things I want to point out on this slide in particular. You see the number of seasonal recreational homes at about 2561. You can also see a couple lines down single family units. Now, this is according to county data. This is how they classify them. Seasonal rec just means second homes that are not considered primary residences. It's everything from yurts to bunkhouses to cabins to homes. That's how, that's how the county classifies it. To be clear though, that's, that is, there, there are nuances to that, okay? But I wanted, to be, I wanted to capture that there are, if you add those up, as far as like dwelling units in the county, there are 5,200 about. So there's almost a one-to-one -one ratio. The last census said 5,600 people. We have almost one house per one person. Uh, and I have learned recently that for county, a house, <coughs> a living, a livable dwelling unit um, means very different things than it does in other communities. Like you don't need water. And I have been found remarkable uh, what people agree to and are okay and comfortable with living in. Um, which just means, again, we look at our housing stock a little different. Okay, I'm not going to go into the short-term dwelling uh, conversation, because then we would be here for a lot longer than we want to be. Suffice it to say, it is something that the community is taking very seriously and looking at. Uh, we have fewer than we're anticipated. Um, it is still part of our housing stuff. That's all I'm going to say about that. There's a committee meeting about it uh, bi-weekly, and then recommendations will be made to the county board in the fall. Okay, the last thing I wanted to point out was the bottom line here. 59, an average of 59 housing permits pulled per year since 2015. The thing I wanted to clarify is, Permit pull is not a house built. You can probably all think about uh, a property that has a driveway that was put in, maybe even a slab, maybe there's you know electric run and then nothing was actually ever, you know, built, or maybe it's been built for five years and they're kind of finishing it. So it's not a livable or finished house. I just want to clarify that because it's giving us context for how many we are, how many permits we're pulling for how many houses we think we need over the next four and a half years. Okay. And also a lot of talking fast because I'm passionate and there's not a lot of time. But Jason, can you back up to that? Yeah. Do you, do you have that ratio or is there something that shows how many yeah. permits for homes, single family homes were pulled and then were No, I don't have that data. And you might have read left room. If you can save questions to the end. Sure. No, Chris, yes, how dare you? Um no, you can. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it'll, there's so many questions. We can talk for hours on the <laughs> Please still come up and speak later. Um, okay. <laughs> this I thought was interesting. This just is a visual mapping, and, and I'm not going to go play around. I played around with a lot on my own time, uh, but just encourage you to take a look. This is according to the state demographer's office. I can click on this link here. Um, and what it pulls up is a visual mapping of vacant housing units. Yeah, I know I'm trying to pull it up here. Does it share now? I want you to share now. Well, I promise it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. I almost see it on the laptop. Can you kind of see it on the laptop? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I know the solution. I'm going to be really quick about this. Okay, share screen, share this one. 
that should work. Of course not. I think people online can see it. Okay, well, I'm gonna very quickly show you. I'm sorry about this. I don't know why it's not doing this, but there's the link. The point is you can zoom in on the county um, on various places in the county and it will eventually come up with boundaries the census creates. And you can click on any of those and it will pull up housing units in that location and the number of vacant and occupied units. The reason I think it's interesting and it's, it's the census data, 2020 census was real tricky. It was a bad year for census. So I'm just putting that caveat in there. But the reason I think it's interesting is because you can go and visually see, according to the self-reported data, where vacant and occupied houses are. So in some places, like you go to the South Shore Devil's Track, it's 128 housing units, 98 of them are vacant, which means reported by the people, uh, according to the census, they're not their permanent residences. That's what it means. It doesn't mean they're actually empty. I'm just saying they're not, they're not occupied year round. Yep. Okay. Now, if I can actually figure out how to get back to this, maybe this will work. That's so bizarre. It's still up, even though I'm not sharing it. I know the people in the on the online world just got a big snap out of my face. Sorry, everybody. Uh, I will allow you. Uh, please talk amongst yourselves for thirty seconds while I figure this out. I apologize. I don't really know what this is about. Did you say that's um, that's the website. It's a very long. Is it the state demographer? Cor correct. It's Minnesota Maps ArcGIS. Oh, now it pulls up. Okay. Okay. Thank you for your patience. Okay, local data. This is according to MLS. Two things I wanna point out about this. The green is the active listings, number of active listings. This is from, if you can't see the back, July of 19 to present July of 2022. The blue is sold. And so MLS is imperfect um, because there is no like gun flinch trail neighborhood in MLS, but it includes Toffee Schroeder, Grand Array, and then Missville. So most of the Cook County Shore and the lion's share of sales happen in that corridor. Okay. So what I want to point out is um, you can see in July 2019, there's a lot more listings. And historically in Cook County, there have been more listings. There's been more on the market. Uh, and you can see what happens May, if you can see um, May 20. So spring of COVID, suddenly Cook County got really interested. Uh, people started buying more, and I looked back for like five, eight years, this was a spike. And what also is interesting, is, well, you can see there's a correlation, of course, there's listings go down, the sales go up. And you can see that sales actually stay, there's a usual trend, if you look at July 2019, there's the usual trend of go up in the spring, close in the summer, come back down in the winter time. That's the, the stereotypical real estate cycle. What we see here is instead, after the peak in, you know, I think that was May, June, like August, cl probably closing, they were closing in August. Um, after that peak, they didn't go down to where they historically go. They stayed relatively up compared to, again, the past. Probably not surprised, but this is, I just wanted to point this out. This is part of the reason we're seeing the pinch that we're seeing. And I know anecdotally, everybody has felt like, wow, housing just got really expensive very quickly, or, you know, there's nothing in the market. There isn't. <laughs> and in inventory right now, you can't really see it. It's I don't, it's not showing up really well. It's like a, when this snapshot was taken in July, it was like 10. By contrast, 130. Same time three years ago. So the other thing to make sure to mention is because the because the data set is so small, one like one sale makes a portion of a lot bigger difference than in the larger community. So I just want to point that out. 130 listings is not a ton of listings, but 10 is really not a ton of listings. So the next one is going to show actual median and average sale prices. And for purposes of understanding the market, I think median is a better, a better metric. Average is really skewed. There's some beautiful properties in the shore, for example. If they sell for a million dollars, suddenly their average is way higher. Median is better when you use it. What you can ob obviously see here too, the orange is the median. Uh, if we were looking at July of 19, it's at about 220,000. Look at July today, it's about 375,000. 
So that's three years. We can look at, we can even go back two years. Let's look at July of 2020. It's about 200, it's about the same, 220 or so, even dips a little bit lower. The point is, it's gone up over $160,000 in two years. Last, and, and this might not be new, but I like to actually quantify the feeling with like data with what's actually been sold and what's been reported. The other thing I want to point out is the, the drop we're seeing at the end here. So this is again, July uh, of 2022. There's an interesting, maybe a coincidental correlation with the Federal Reserve raising interest rates. Yeah. And then suddenly, <laughs> so I'll be very interested to see what happens in August and September, but I would suspect there's gonna be some leveling off of that. But again, one thing changes, that's wrong. Okay. Really? Two seconds ago. I'll do it the old fashioned way. Oh, Mark Scott requests. I don't know. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Sorry about that. That doesn't work. Great. Where are the buyers coming from? I did a snapshot review. There's something called a certificates of real estate value. You have to be sold a house. Every time it happens in the state of Minnesota, a CRV gets filled up. Um, the Assessors use it, the state uses it for assessment purposes, property tax purposes, a whole bunch of things. I looked at 89 closed transactions from May to May. And I just wanted to get an idea where are the people coming from? Like we looked at a little earlier, there's a, there are a lot of second homes, right? That are, that are just classified as seasonal recreational. And classification does not capture everything. There's a lot of self-reporting going on. I just want to be clear about that. It's what the assessor has. So of those, 30 of them, or over a third, or people with permanent addresses outside of Cook County. Not surprising, but it does validate the trend that we've seen, of course. Uh, most from the Twin Cities Metro, also not surprising. And, and, and by the way, I want to be clear, there is no value statement on this. So I'm a transplant, so I would be hypocritical to say, how dare you people from outside of town buy? That's not what I'm saying. This is just the reality of what's happening in the county. Uh, a few from Duluth, several from other states, which was really interesting to me. Um, I just think it's interesting to look at I just took a snapshot and it was a little putsy work, but I went through all of them and looked at permanent addresses with a reporting where, like, which indicates where they're going to fall home. Because when you buy a new home as your new home, your new address is your new home. We're not alone. This is obviously not a surprise either. Something called the national housing crisis. I don't know, I've heard about it recently. Um, we're going to talk just a little bit about why. So, again, I'm not going to read all the text too long. 2007 to 2014, about seven year period, the number of new hustle creations. So the people that would normally, you know, graduate from school or college and then go get a house or get an apartment for the first time, that number was cut in half for seven years. There's 50% of the amount of household growth. Uh, and the reason it wasn't population based. The millennial generation is now the biggest home buying cohort in the country. And uh, that's the second biggest population that we've ever had for a generation. So it wasn't a function of suddenly there was a demographic cliff. That wasn't it. It was the recession. Um, so I just want to be clear. That's what caused it. Cool. You know, consequently, not surprisingly, demand plummeted. Household starts, and there's a graph later that I'll show you. Household starts or household creation plummeted. Um, we all probably remember photos of uh, subdivisions built in other suburban areas where half built and people walked because the contractors were bankrupt. We still have not caught up the labor shortage from pre-recession to today. We still don't have the number of contractors we did. It's important for a little bit later. Um, right, so it's effectively, there's, there's that sort of um, stereotypical meme of a, a millennial living in their parents' basement until they were 30 years old. Yeah. I don't know how they do it. Um, but uh, that was a real thing, whether it was their basement or they had a bunch of roommates. That happened a lot in urban communities. People just had roommates, you know, in their 30s. They just because they had to because they couldn't afford not to. So in 2014, all that pressure built up for seven years. And then in 2014, 15, especially up here, uh, we're a little slower. Like we kind of joked in Duluth. Duluth's like four years behind Minneapolis. And then I'm just anticipating that Cook County is a couple years behind Duluth, trend wise, typically. Um, 2014 or so, the levy broke. The economy really started turning around. You started seeing multifamily happen in Minnesota. We started seeing it more Duluth um, because suddenly the largest, you know, new household starters wanted a place, and a lot of them at the same time. So you had a ton of pressure suddenly on the market, not enough places, um, and then you also still did not recover the amount of contractors you had. So, because why would you? Why would you stay in that business? A lot of people, a lot of them. My brother was one of them. He had a contracting company. They reskilled. 
they retooled, they did something else. They said, this is too risky, I'm not gonna deal with it. Uh, and so we've lost a huge number of skilled laborers. And now of course, we've got people retiring that have a lot of institutional knowledge and have a lot of experience building homes and doing contracting work. We don't have the replacements. Okay, this is not all doom and gloom, it's mostly, but I just wanna be honest about it. Um, so then of course, introduced COVID, which is just fun. Um, we have the, the path of demand, the lack of contractors, and then we have a pandemic. So there's in, in the graphs we'll see later too. There's just there's growth, 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 growth in the in the construction trades because everything halted for like two months. Banks were like, we're not going to close on the deal yet. We got to see what happens. There was a lot of uncertainty. Surprisingly, that is has come back up after COVID. Now, of course, with rates going back up, that's a little bit of a story. The point is, it was already difficult because of pent up pressures, and then we have logistics challenges, um, doors, appliances, windows. I can tell you, rehabbing my own house. They were three months late. So I had to reschedule contract. It was it's a mess. Think of doing that with 200 unit apartment building and you have contractors. It's just, it becomes crazy and expensive very quickly. And I can see one ref laughing because they're like, yeah, we totally get it. Um, so we have that on top of not enough dock workers, truck drivers, all of the things to bring the things like that's exacerbating the problem. Down at the bottom, I just want to point out, these are just three random commodities that are heavily involved with construction, lumber, copper, crude oil to get the things all the places, because things are made all over the world and then shipped here and then assembled in the house. This is just since 2015, up 222%, up 166, up 176. You could go down the list of other commodities. Granted, this was taken in July. Maybe they're up or down. I haven't looked recently. Point is, that's a function of uh, largely a function of COVID. Like the lumber, I, I'm sure we all remember like a two by four was insane. I bought a sheet of plywood for $44. I bought passed out because I needed 10 of them. Um, that is not, that is not helping, not helping. Okay, why is this so expensive? So I've heard a lot um, from uh, folks, understandably, we're, we're wondering why is the government getting more involved with housing? You know, the HUD was created in, I think, 65. Anyway, the point is, they're asking, why why now? Why do we need help now? We were able to buy a house, raise a family, et cetera, et cetera. Totally get it. Um, the reason is because of this. So the, the bottom line is income change over time, and the top is house prices over time. And it there's it's, this isn't an anecdote. <laughs> uh, this is national averages. So what we see here in word form is since 1965, homes have increased seven and a half times faster Income. So if you were to buy a house adjusting for inflation, you buy a house in 1965, $172,000. The same house is $375,000 today. That's $200,000. And incomes, meanwhile, have increased $10,000. So it's not a huge surprise that housing is a problem because you can only build so many that people can afford. This is a national problem. Again, Cook County, we're extra special. We'll talk about that in just a sec. Um, I could keep going on inflation. And the point is it's expensive and it's gotten way more expensive over time. So what about Cook County? What are, how does that affect like our incomes? What I want to point out a couple things. One, household income. This is deed, Minnesota deed, the report. Uh, they publish a report every year on different segments of the state. Uh, the most recent one was this one. Um, and according to deed, the median household income is about $60,000 for Cook County. I'm gonna skip over a couple of things here. If we go down the total number of reported jobs, just a huge asterisk on this whole presentation. The data we the, the, the data we can show is only as good as the data we get. I just wanna make that clear. Like nothing's perfect. We get what we can. Let's try to make sense and build a framework. That's what we're doing. So is this is it actually 24.55? No, it's something north or south of that. Uh, how much? I don't know, but it's a good enough snapshot. The point is of those almost 50% according to D, are qualified as um, tourism related and make $26,000 or less. So you see where the housing problem comes into play. This is not news to you. It's just numbers to the thing you already knew. Now, granted, I have an asterisk at the bottom on purpose. I've talked with many employers who've said in the last couple of years they have raised wages because they have to. So I want to acknowledge that, that employers are trying to do their part, for, both for retention purposes to keep people there and to try to recruit the work that they need, the workers they need rather. So it's probably higher than 26 now, let's say it's 30, it's still $30,000 uh, when we're talking about housing prices that are just exponential. Okay, a couple of newer trends. We're almost done with this portion and then I'll shut up, we'll talk with Chris, yeah. Newer trends, this is again not news, people purchasing second homes. That's happened here a lot. 
but something that hasn't happened is the retirement of a baby boomer generation, about 10,000 people a day nationally. Uh, I get why they want to live here. I want to live here. Um, what it just means is more pressure on a small housing stock. That's what it means. So that, in concert with fiber, which, by the way, is fantastic. It's better than I had downtown Duluth. Um, sometimes I joke with former colleagues, hey, you need to bump some internet. You can come on up and you can use my, my internet. Um, the, the point, though, is we have that awesome asset in fiber that's been connected in this community, which means people can do, which has never happened before since COVID. This is a remarkable, interesting trend. People can sort of transition into retirement. They don't have to be in the off state. My uncle's a prime example. He lives downtown Minneapolis. He has a cabin in Hillary, Wisconsin. He works from the cabin half the time because he can. And he's a baby boomer. And he's like, eh, I don't want to quite totally retire, but I don't want to go on the off side of his week. That's great. Um, so that's a new opportunity for people to buy second homes that they know they're going to retire in ahead of schedule, maybe, because now they can still get work done. Where does that end? I don't know, but it's something that's happening. What kind of housing do we need? So I'm going to go into quick high level, the, the needs analysis that I was talking about, what it says we can absorb. Um, I even noted down here, that is important, but people, because people are involved, so that is never perfect. Uh, but this is according to the study that the EDA gratefully uh, uh, paid for and instigated before the HRA was ready and up and running. Uh, it was forward thinking of them. I really appreciate it because then I can give it to developers. And I've had several questions from people in the community. Why do we need this? We know that we need housing. Two reasons, developers and banks. You got to prove that there's a need and you're not just telling them, we need housing, I promise. Like, I'm, you're a nice guy. Sure you do. How much? A lot. Um, it's helpful to have an expert third party do that for you. And then the banks will also say, right, but how much is there really the need because it's a risk for them. So this is useful for those two reasons long. Okay, rental units. For those of you who've already seen this, sorry, you can tune out, grab a snack. Um, for those of you who haven't, I just want to highlight a couple of things. One, the top, not surprisingly, the biggest need in the county is for, for units rented at 50% of the area you need income. So we would call that affordable, deeply affordable housing. Uh, 140 to 150 units. This is by the end of 2026, which the end of 22 is kind of going fast. So it's like a little under four and a half years, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Three and a half years, something like that. My brain's tired. Okay, um, market rate. I highlighted that because that surprises a lot of people. Market rate is like you charge what you can get. That's what market rate means. Whatever the market's willing to command and pay, that's what you charge for rent. And there's the second biggest category is market rate rents. So when you add those up, it's 190 to 210 units just in multifamily rentals. It, I can tell you from someone who recently moved here and talking to like 100 people about this, there's nothing to rent in Cook County. <laughs> you have to know someone uh, and you have to get lucky. Like you all know the stories, probably talked to many of you about this. Um, you have to get, you have to know somebody. There, there are a couple of websites that where people can post some things, but there's no like, I'm gonna go to apartments.com and see what they've got, because you'll find nothing. Uh, that's part of the reason that this is here. Second thing, single family homes. Um, I highlighted the bottom for a reason. When I saw this uh, from the consultant, I said, well, wait a second, that should be flipped. Like the great demand is for product, products that are under 300,000, right? That's what you would think. So I just, I highlighted the point out, we had a nice conversation about this. The reason that it's this way is because you cannot project what is needed based on hopes. So they're projecting the need based on data of sales. And what has been selling has been that tier of house. Now, having said that, oh, sorry, part of the reason that that's the case is because it's very difficult to build and sell something for under $300,000. I have some folks in the room who know that's very true. So if you could build it and sell it for under that price, these numbers would change. But the reality is that hasn't been happening in any significant amount. And so they can't say that's the greatest need because it's, it's so difficult to build it at that price point. They would be saying, It'd be, you know, there'd be a huge demand if you could sell a house for $100,000, there'd be like 500 units needed. Well, sure. Uh, but if you can't do it, what's the plan? So that's the reason that that's that way. Lastly, senior housing, so the three buckets, rental, single family, senior, senior. And to be clear, these are different. They consider them different in, in the study. So these are not, like, there's no overlap. There's no Venn diagram here. They're considering them all separate needs. The top three categories, really, I think can be mostly addressed with market rate housing. Uh, what we're seeing is a trend nationally, and this is the case in Duluth, 
Um, for example, we lived in a, in a, a, a new uh, market rate apartment for six months between house flips. Uh, only time we lived in an apartment was interesting. Um, we were very surprised at the number of people who were retirees and families that were in those homes. So, I assumed, I, and I worked in housing, I assumed there'd be a lot more younger professionals. Half of the buildings were retired folks. They the downsized, they didn't want the maintenance, they were figuring out what they wanted to do next. But we don't really have that product here. So all that's to say, if we had more of those options, we would take care of some of those other categories. I highlight and circle the, the ones below because those are the tough ones. I know assisted living has been talked about. You can't see it's 30 to 40 units and 20 to 25 assisted living memory care. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that's been a conversation we community for a long time. And the reason it's so hard to build is not just because of the cost to build, but because you need to staff it on the back end and it costs four to $5,000 a month to stay there. So it's not that the need's not there, it's the math that's the problem. And just maybe some of you read about this or heard about it on WTIP, the hospital is having to consider closing part of their nursing home wings because they can't step it. So they have a 25 person, I think, uh, posting, they have 25 postings right now for jobs at the hospital. So, so all that's to say, if I had the money and the land and I built it tomorrow, I don't know that it would make a difference because we have to get the people up here to service those types of projects. And right now, clearly we do not have that. So there's a little bit of a chicken and egg, but I'm convinced you know, provide the housing, it'll work out. Or it won't. Um, okay. <laughs> Summary. We need between 520 and 615 units. It's a lot. Um, again, your projections. But even if we say, let's say 500, as a proportion of our housing stock, that's significant. And that's proposed over the next three and a half, four years. And that's across all types, all affordabilities, right? Um, so that means 175 units a year. And Chris, to your earlier question, kind of dovetailing off of that, we were pulling 59 a year building permits. Even if they were all built, we're still 115 shot. Why aren't we building more? And I'm almost done, and we'll turn it over to I'll ask Chris come up in just a second. A couple of reasons. Talk about the money. We get the, the, the price is the big one. Unfortunately, money is the big problem. It's all math. Um, this is just, I just thought this would be interesting. Last year, interest rates about 3% on average for a 30, 30 year mortgage, which is, it's a car loan. It's crazy. Historically, it's crazy. Um, not complaining, awesome, but crazy. Uh, July, I took a snapshot. They've come down a little bit, but they're on the way back up. The Fed just announced last week in Jackson Hole they're going to continue with uh, rate increases, which means mortgage rate. So it's likely to go back up to this. A 30 year mortgage, $300,000. <clears throat> $640 a month difference. Just nothing else changes. Same house, same taxes, just the mortgage interest rate. That's half of a two bedroom house, right? A two bedroom apartment. That's just from interest. So we have that going against us. Contractor capacity. I will let Jeff and Chris talk a little bit about this. Um, point is, most, most contractors, I mean, you all know this, try to call one to. My brother laughed. He said, Somebody wanted me to build a deck, just a deck. And then they have people who want to build like whole homes. So they're so busy um, that, that they can choose what they want to do and what makes sense often. And there just isn't the workforce for them to tap. So in other words, I put everyone short staff, like there's hiring all over the place. Why that's important is because you can't just, you can't just, it makes it that much harder to go to other places to pull people and say, hey, want to be an apprentice. Hey, want to learn how to do this trade. There's so more, there's just fewer people. You're competing with every other industry to get that same talent or potential talent. Um, the last thing is just in the housing space world, Cook County map does not work well. Jeff can talk about this later. Um, the point is things like the low income housing tax credit program. I don't know if any of you have heard of that. It's a federal affordable housing program. I think 92 or 93% of all affordable housing, even affordable in the country, has been using that program. Uh, that's been built to use that program. Cook County. Math is bad for that program. Uh, again, one roof can talk a little bit more about that. But there are other programs like down payment assistance. One example I hear a lot about what if we pay down payment assistance? Okay, first of all, you have to be income qualified. Like AEOA has that program. You have to be income qualified to do it, which means you're not making a lot of money. So, what's available? Well, the median house is $360,000. How much of a down payment do you have to make for them to afford? Like, you run out of money with one house. So, those programs. Often don't work. Okay, promise I'll be done quick. Chris, would you mind coming up? We're gonna have Chris go and talk to us a little bit about his experience in Cook County. 
Uh, I still sit. Yeah, a lot of chairs for you. Chairs for you, the water's for you. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, maybe Skittles for you too, if you want some Skittles. No? Okay. Do it back in the pile. Don't want to call it Skittles. Yeah. Squeaking noise? Yeah. 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 Dog whistle. Yeah. I know. I I think it's coming from. I've been listening. It's not here. There's There's something squeaking. Welcome to my world. Oh wow! It sounds like it might be a battery for a hearing ear. Yeah. Okay. I can't hear it. Who said? Um. Okay, well, sorry. Older folks don't hear that. Yeah. Great. Great. <laughs> I'm fine. Yeah, they're ringing, so. <laughs> if you have tinnitus, you're, it's nothing new. Um, okay. Hey. Hey, how's it going? Fine. How's your day? <laughs> long time. Yeah, yeah, amen. Um, so I'm just pulling up some photos. You want to walk us through, first of all, so this is just a little more informal. I'm just going to do a little QA with them because if you don't have to present, fantastic. Great. Um, this is Mink Ranch, right? Yes, everything that is Mink Ranch. So, first of all, who are you? What do you do? And uh, what's this about? So, I'm Chris Skilling. I'm a building contractor, um, build houses. And uh, <clears throat> since 2016, I've built uh, four homes on spec with Mink Ranch. So, the Mink Ranch is a development in Wilson that had a shared shared well and septic system and road it's a cul-de-sac uh it was originally built with some 15 single family homes um in 2002 and something happened shortly after 2002 where um the development you know, just kind of dropped off the place uh, i think three homes uh put in by like dynamic homes that um, Isaac Hansen's did a lot of work in there. And then it just sat dormant for the next uh, 14 years. <laughs> and then uh, in 2016, I had the opportunity to buy one of the lots on contract. And the owner was kind enough to subordinate the property so that I could finance the home on speculation. And uh, I thought I'd build it, sell it move on i built it it didn't sell but uh, i immediately put rent for four years um, two years later and i don't know if you have um I, yeah i have the next yeah so two years later um 2018 we started lot six which is the right to photos there um, it was the same owner, same arrangement. Um, we, we completed the first project, so the bank was willing to uh, finance the second home under the same arrangement. Um, I don't know that I would have been able to uh, come up with the down payment to finance a project like that on my own, but because the owners were willing to subordinate the project, um, putting the Bank in first position, and then in second position, and then actually can always ask. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> the lot six house, same thing, built it, didn't know exactly what we we're going to do with it, needed it built. Um, nobody offered to buy them. We didn't really list either of those, um, and I wasn't going to let them sit. Them. So lots five and six, we just rented them away. Um, fast forward to um, 2021, uh, and with a different owner in the main um, having completed the first two projects, a different owner was willing to contract for two at a time, um, the same terms, similar terms. Um, so we did two at a time last winter. Uh, we got foundations in by um, Halloween. We always think Halloween. It's going to snow over the Halloween. Um, and we were building over the winter, and uh, this summer we're completely not. 
in the main grant, um, there's two more that are with the association right now. And then there's five more that could be brought back from the association. So uh, that's one of the things I'm working on is to try and keep building them in. If somebody else wanted to buy one of those lots and come in there and build something, sweet, I would encourage anybody to do that. But since it's been sitting there with nothing happening, I feel I'm working on it. So, um, so you've been building since 2016? Is when you started your first house? Is that right? Uh, no, I've been building. Uh, I've been in construction since I was eight. So. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, that's when you started your first like house on your own. At the main branch was 2016, right? Yeah, the, uh, on speculation. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> oh, thank God people like you do that. Because um, it's a risk. Like, it's a huge risk. Um, and so, um, I have to admit this. Um, the first two years that I rented, lot five and lot six, uh, my accountant informed me the following year that I was operating at a loss. Um, Significantly, so uh, I thought I was doing service by having this this nice price point to be able to rent these things. By the time I get shook out, at the end of those two years, um, you know, negative income on this ownership of those properties. So learning, I paid my tuition. Off. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what else? Speaking of learning curves, Bob. Um, what else surprised you? I mean, you're doing it in Cook County. Um, I've, I've been to some of these places. Uh, they're nice homes. Uh, what uh, What have you learned that you were surprised about building? Because you said you've been in construction since you're 18. Yeah. Um, uh, projects like this are easier in some respects because we don't have anybody else to answer to. Um, Meaning the, the lenders want to see that you're building what you say you're going to do. And in this case, the association um, wants to see what you're building that you said you're going to do. But when it comes down <coughs> to um, being able to adapt and design build on the fly, there's no, um, you know, there's no clients being picky about what goes in there. We can put something together that's nice, um, but cost-effective and build it off the shelf and just move forward with that. But every, every time there's a scene, they call in an architect. So, uh, so that's the advantage to doing it, is the freedom and flexibility. Correct. What's the downside? Uh, all the risks. <laughs> and not sleeping at night while you're building them, or not sleeping at night when you have a uh, there's a sunset on the on the contracts, and there's grace periods within loans, um, and there's a day that you're going to have to close on the contract and pay on that mortgage in full, whether or not it's done. And um, you know, financing something like this, uh, lenders want their hooks in everything. So my, you know, putting up my company and putting up the property is enough to make the risk into you know, everything I could possibly put into a personal financial statement. That's what the, they call the UCC or Universal Collateral some clause. Not clause. I know you're talking about. Yeah. So that's scary. So just <laughs> so just all the risk is right. Right. Um. So. So this is this the development. The recent ones that he's done um, were around that three hundred thousand dollar mark. Yeah. The, the last two, and so I mentioned it because that's a that's on the upper end. Of, let's say the median in household income is about sixty. Is what we said before about fifty nine five. Uh, depending on interest rates, it's about a two hundred and fifty to two hundred sixty thousand dollar house. It depends on down payments, a lot of other things, right? Ballpark. That's fifty grand more. But like what you can build and sell these for is 50 grand more than the median household you can quote unquote afford. And from what I've heard from you and learned from you, margins on these are not huge, which is part of the reason people aren't building all over the place. So what's the answer from your perspective, someone building here, is it to build just really tiny houses? 
uh, that are affordable. By the way, I bought one of these houses, so just close it. Yeah. Um, it was available, and I very much like it. I have a favorite. Con I love all the contractors in Cook County. Just to be clear, um, I don't have an answer. But the, the answer is uphill, and it's it's trudging. Um, none of these were easy. They all had their individual challenges. We. Uh, my company has a way with um, always wishing we could have things closed even by the time it snows, and we end up like shoveling off slots. Like that. Um, but that's also a thing in Cook County. Like, the rest of the state has you know, six months of winter. We have nine and a half. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, you know, in the summertime, you're focused on lot prep, woodwork, excavation, and concrete. Um, and if, if you want to be able to get far enough ahead that you're not laying too off in the winter, or entirely out of work uh, from what you call unemployment um, or you know, taking vacation or something like that, <laughs> then you have to focus on all those things that you can't do in the wintertime. And it appears that you can frame in the wintertime. So that's that's an added challenge. Um, How is, you know, I was talking about contractor capacity. What has been, not your capacity per se, if you had more people skilled labor that were able to work for you, would that change things? So is it, I'm assuming it's very difficult to find folks? Yes. Yeah, so um, <coughs> in the summertime, my crew might be six people, in the wintertime it's three, and I don't want to. So when you're framing in snowfall, yeah. you're down a couple folks because they're like, forget that. Right. Well, it's, yeah, we lost, we lost half of my crew to high school. So, you know. <laughs> Education's a good school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, school. Um, so, so, <laughs> so, you're building a product that is, I mean, like I said, you don't have an answer for why you build something even more affordable than this because the margins are tight. Yeah. Um, so, maybe. So, uh, one thing I can add about this lot five. Um, the first one, one built in 2016, was two bedroom, one bathroom, uh, about 780 square feet. Uh, lot six was just shy of 1,100 square feet, three bedroom, one bathroom, open um, uh, living room, kitchen, floor plan. It had an attached garage, um, but the Lots one and two, Jason's house and the lot two house, you have a picture of it's blue. They were the same floor plan as the lot six house. They were adapted for the site. So we moved some windows so that they were custom suited for the site. We just flip flop with it. So we, it was very measured. Um, all the kitchens were the same. They came from different places, but they were the same packages. We repeat those packages. We we can measure them against the previous year and see how much they increased and measure them between the time we purchased them and the time that we had quoted and see how much they increased. Um, something like that that's repeatable is, is probably that. So to have basically the design done, you know where you get your stuff, you know the, the materials you're going to use. Yeah. So you cut out time, you cut out design work. Right. It, except on yours, I don't no, if I told you this, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what you do? <laughs> well, you, it's it's yours now. So, <laughs> yeah, no, no, okay. no. um, we designed those lots one and two houses with zip R sheeting, and so we had ordered trusses uh, two inches narrower on either side because the zip R sheeting would be continuous up to here. Uh, when we went to order that stuff after trusses had already been dropped, it was not working. So we had to adapt the building um, after the fact. And so there's no installation, is what you're saying? That was right, exactly. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. To see that. But th this is the type of stuff happening right now. It's always happened on the shore, but um, it's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that quick. So you know, I was going over a bunch of data about how things have changed the last three years. From a high level, right, nationally even, how have you seen things change 
since 2016, but in the last few years particularly, what's been the biggest changes and challenges? Uh, I don't know about a few years, but definitely pandemic. There's that, that point that you could say we need a change. We knew something was changing and started, started fast and happened faster. Um, things have always been hard to source. You know, anything you can think of, if it's not in the county, you can figure two weeks to do. Okay. So, our local lumber yards are similar to contractors in that they are overworked and understaffed. And they're, they're doing the absolute best, but that's just the way it is. Um, and that, that isn't getting better as well. And, you know, it's it's which comes first. So, they're, they're just like contractors that are understaffed because there's no the people, there's no the people. Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so could you just build um, build some more houses real quick? I mean, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, one final question for you. Yeah. Uh, first of all, you know, so uh, a, a sort of a um, principle of economic development, if you will, is you focus on the businesses you have and growing them because the return on that is much higher than trying to work through. The reason I mentioned that is because people who like like Chris and other companies in town who are trying to get the work done, like those are the people we want to be successful. You're going to have better return on investment. It's going to happen faster. Your growth is better. Um, so that's my way of saying thank you for doing this because I know sleepless nights are not fun. Um, what what would be helpful for you as you're trying to figure out what you can build, uh, both what the county needs and what you want to build? Like what is it that would help you? Um, and I can be really honest. Well, please. Now that you've yeah. said that, I can't see you. Yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, in in any of the development, there is just miles of red tape, um, and it's it's the local the local bureaucracy. Um, everybody has as individuals, fantastic people, fantastic community uh, into the system that I have to work within. Um, it gets really tough, and multiple layers of pain. Right, so. These were the single family developments were relatively low hanging fruit. Um, the windows of time that I had to uh, get get approvals and create pro formas and get finance initiated uh, for executed contract was was pretty loose. Um, other projects, big larger projects, have very narrow time windows with. Um, Dozens of different disciplines, whether it's uh, legal, financial, surveying, engineering, uh, uh, local uh, local jurisdiction, whether it's uh, whether it's uh, city, county, state, those type of things. They all have to align in a really short window of time. <laughs> I'm just one guy. <laughs> um, so, uh, and I don't know the answer. I just sure. know that that is a clear challenge. So yeah. All of those things um, to make something, you know, come to your own. Well, thank you for the brutal honesty. Yeah. Yeah. How many civil contractors go to the right to try to get the problem solved? That are developing? What's that? That are developing? Well, they could build. build. So I'm going to also like this and do the honesty is um, uh, I'm a I'm a blood company and I, I can speak for other contractors that there's not a lot of incentive to step away from really good and architecturally beyond custom homes for some of the clientele that wants to live here with cash <coughs> to. Uh, you know, operate operate rentals at a loss for the first two years. Um, you know, or just put myself at risk for stuff that has very narrow margins. So when we create, you know, pro forma and we have these margins, if something like this, if, if I'm on the hook as the developer, um, when we have cost increases and overruns, um, we, we can't just pass that on to the client. We, the, the margins get narrow. No, because they're not existing. So, my fellow contractors know this, and maybe they've known this longer. Um, and so, 
to, to create an incentive for, for people to do this. There is actually other people that have done it. Um, uh, Matt did, did, did duplexes. Um, the Smiths have done some single family homes. We have a developer in the room and it's an habitat. Um, so it's out there, it's happening. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know what the answer is, but that, there, there's a reason why. So uh, Cliff notes is that the incentivization structure is such that you have to be a glutton for punishment or maybe community minded or or you can do this more quickly and easily, especially in spec when you don't have clients to do filling projects. But the lion's share of the sensible money making happens in other spheres. Yes. Custom home building. Okay. Uh, another difference too is that I am I'm not uh, anticipating being able to being able to retire on social security. So I may not see the return now, but maybe 30 years or so. Um, I can do something for this. There's that. Long, long view. Anything else you um, think that would be helpful for us to know? Yes, absolutely. Because it is pretty important. That lower left picture. Yeah. Uh, I took away some um, assisted living. Chris, can you turn this way and talk about it? Absolutely. Thank you. Yep. I want to see the pictures too, so I know what I'm talking about. Right, right. So, <clears throat> Uh, 2019, uh, what was formerly Hill Haven Assisted Living <clears throat> had been empty for a couple of years because it had been on the market. 4,500 square feet, and uh, it's on about two and a half acres, uh, two miles east of Del Rey. And it had been on the market, but it didn't really sell because it wasn't suitable as a single family home. And it, it, wasn't suitable or ready to be vacation rental. Um, in the same fashion as the other projects, um, I would contract with the owners to um, redevelop it yeah. mm -hmm. um, into six apartments. Um, we had a, a one year grace period on the contract, and um, I was able to uh, get. Commercial financing, the contracts subordinated the property, put in the bank interest position. This was a huge uh, risk that the owners, the sellers, took to do this. At the one year grace period uh, was when all the bank was going to do. The, the project um, was about six <coughs> times the scope that I was on the hook for when that grace period was. So, of course, during the project, I was sweating bullets. Um, but in so it's 12 months grace period, in the 11th month, I had a full lease and project was So I actually had a full lease set before the project was um, And it didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the goal. Yeah. Um, it was really challenging because. Um, it was originally a six bathroom, 10 bedroom, two kitchen house. And <coughs> to divide that into six individual apartments was this crazy puzzle of electricity and heat and firewalls and sound and, and entries. The way we did it, the only extra entryway we added was in the lower left corner of the picture there. Uh, we took a window, we excavated, and did the chain wall and added one extra view. The rest was done with uh, <coughs> one shared foyer, and then there's some common space. So, all the residents have access to the panels. There is um, two sets of washer dryers, and everybody has access to the mechanicals, um, but everybody has a private apartment. Yeah, we keep it mowed and we keep it plowed. And uh, because the building is um, 24 years old now, we are offering it. Um, we, we kept two of the original kitchens that were part of uh, the main kitchen of the original facility. 
and um, there was like a um, mother in law's quarters or uh, was it an ADU? Uh, it was no. in the building, though. Right? No, it was in the building. Um, uh, here. Oh, here, here. So the two largest are on the east side, and those are probably eight, nine hundred square feet. And then the original kitchens. So we added four kitchens. One is a kitchenette. It was actually in the upper left hand That one's an efficiency, and the whole efficiency is maybe 216 square feet but it's got a kitchen at a bathroom and um, it's affordable to me yeah so again affordable is is that relative term um but the price points in there are uh 750 to 1250 and that includes everything garbage service plowing uh, uh wi-fi that's Laundry. It's pretty affordable. Yeah, you can't do that with new construction. No. No. And we could not even think about building that property. The building is one thing, but the property, uh, just property development itself, is very expensive. Uh, couldn't think about doing that for any other year. Well, if I see some more, there are a couple I can think of uh, properties that would, you could do the same thing with. Maybe we could entice you to do more of that. Because redevelopment's part of the deal, especially with blighted buildings and underutilized. Turn them into housing. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. And please keep building. Please don't stop building. Thank you, Chris. <laughs>
and it happened uh, 2018 and 19. Um, lots of great folks stepped up to help pay for that project. The details of that are right there. Um, that project is is has been fully occupied uh, those 16 units since we built them. Um, and we're actually um, working to try to figure out what the long-term plan is because the numbers don't, don't work terribly well for one roof um, as it was conceived, but um, we learned a lot. Chris should be here to hear that story Saturday too. Um, we also did 10 homes in Grand Marais proper, uh, Nordic Star. Um, we did uh, eight homes with one modular contractor, the same or modular company, the same one that we did uh, on the project in Lutzen. And then we did the last two of Mr. Rystead's company, Ideal Homes. Um, <laughs> And uh, you, you can read about that, but um, most of these homes, even though we designed some of them financially to sell to people at 115% of their immediate income, what we found was that the demand for this particular product was more around the 60 to 70% of their immediate income, which is about what we find in Duluth as well, where we've done most of our work um, historically. Um, but uh, yeah, there was demand for those homes. They, they did sell and um, happy about, about making that contribution in, in Grand Marais. That was a better uh, exercise for one roof than, than, the, the, than the apartment project was, but it was still pretty tough. Um, I'm happy to say that I believe last month, one of those homes resold uh, affordably as a community land trust home and this month another one went. And so um, the, the, the homes were designed with input from the community to have the to be in long-term affordable homes and, um, and that's that's working. So because we did it that way, two more families have been served. And um, I should have probably brought the letter that the person, one of the people that was selling um, said, sent to our staff recently. It, it, it's just about, well, lots of things make me cry, but it would make you real feel good to do. Um, I, I think the community should be proud of, of those homes and the, the community that the folks are building up there. It's 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 really great. Um, here are the, the contributions and a, and a happy homeowner um, to, to make the homes affordable. Uh, Decker is one of the projects that we've finished in Duluth recently. It's 42 units. It's a tax credit project. It's one of the ones Jason said the numbers don't work for here. A couple of reasons for that. One, it's just too many to bring online in one place at one time. Uh, the, the other is th there's a very sophisticated scoring process that the state uses to decide what projects get funded and what projects don't. And um, increasingly, the projects that get funded need to have a higher proportion of units dedicated to folks that are homeless, higher proportion of units dedicated to folks that are disabled, and that typically is meaning they have significant mental health, chronic and persistent mental health issues. And, and so it's a very complicated thing to drop into a very little community when you think of how, how many of the units this would, would be relative to the existing housing stock here. Um, and crazy expensive, crazy expensive. Um, you know, you can do the math on the per unit cost there, eleven and a half million million for 42 homes. So, um, the, the, this the, um, next next few slides is about something that we call the new model for housing folks that have been experiencing homelessness. Uh, we're moving forward with this project in, in Duluth, uh, hopefully in the spring. It's gotten funding commitments from the city and the county to fully fund the project. And we're working with partners to, 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 to bring it to, to reality. Um, but we started with a broad group of stakeholders. Mr. Hill, before he became a trader and moved, moved to Cook County, was part of that, that group of stakeholders. Um, and, and it was a really fun process. But a lot of folks that you know work with people that are homeless, provide services, or house folks that have been homeless. Uh, a, a couple of architects. We had a, a contract pretty close to the process. And, and the idea was, is there something else that we could design and build that would come in closer to a price point that we could we, we could afford to do without without having it cost $11.2 million. And so what we found is this is about half, half the money of a typical tax credit 
fund the project in the end. Um, there's small, I won't read what's what's written up here to you, but you can see it's about the size of a dormitory. Uh, it has a shower, uh, small kitchenette, built-in storage, space for bed, table, um, toilet, sink. Um, gives, gives you a sense of the ground floor of it where there would be um, four units and then eight units upstairs that's because of the service provision and the, and the community space that's built in um, upstairs is eight units and that gives you a little bit of sense of the outside view of it um, we are contemplating is this something that could be altered to use for some worker housing here in, in Cook county um, and, and could we build it even maybe more affordably than the first first look at it um, another project that we finished that Jason was also involved in because this is property we got through the, the city's rebuild program. Um, it's, it's a, we call it the skinny house. Um, it's a, about, a, about a thousand square foot home. It's 12 feet wide. Um, and uh, it's actually quite lovely to, to be in. It feels great. And it, um, there's, if I'm legally blind. I can't see that far, but if you want to scroll down that that, that um, address or or send an email after, I can send you a link. But it, there's a virtual tour that you can do that walks you through the house. It's it's pretty great. Um, but that was about two hundred seventy thousand dollars, and so you can mind the number Chris was saying before, trying to build for about three three hundred thousand. Um, it's you have to find someone that's a little crazy like him to even attempt this, and there aren't many. We have one. One stick built contractor in, in the Duluth area that we've been working with for a few years and, and kind of trying to refine things. So, Jason wanted me to talk a little bit about changes in, in, in housing development. Uh, I, I've been doing this for about 24 years, and um, of course, it just keeps getting more expensive. I was really glad to see the stat of, of and wanted to make sure people really let it sink in. That, that house prices since 1965 have gone up seven times faster than incomes because that's really, you know, you know, when we when we orient people at one roof, we, we say often, whether they're board staff or volunteers, if if the market worked for poor folks, we wouldn't exist, and, and, and so that that's what it's it just keeps the divide gets bigger and the challenge gets uh, bigger as well as well as the acknowledgement of a problem gets bigger. And so you have to be a little stupid hopeful to keep doing this work for a quarter century, right? <laughs> and part of part of what's given me more lately is that there is broader acknowledgement of the problem and there have been flashes of a view of potentially <laughs> more resources. And sometimes it happens. The city of Duluth kicked a lot of money toward housing from the Rescue Plan Act funds. Um, uh, Congress was on the verge of passing a historic bill last spring and then and then they had good luck. But I do think there's a potential for more resources to be coming um, and or more societal fixes. And I have to be a little careful which recording as I talk about this in, but in in most Western countries that are as as industrialized as we are, there's a lot more um, interference from government in how housing is priced and valued and sold and managed. And it, it could be a little different. We're, we're pretty liberty based here, but it, it doesn't have to be that way necessarily. So the Cook County challenges, um, I don't, let's see, is there anything that's new there compared to what Chris said <laughs> um, or Jason had said? I don't think so. Um, it's, that, that's that's all of all of the things, right? Um, bed, bedrock, bedrock, bedrock. Um, and and then I, I would say maybe maybe one more thing. So, um, it is true that there are a lot of regulatory things you have to go through to to build. It's actually less than in Duluth, and and so one of the things, and along with that, less than comes with, um, and this is meant as a critique of just what we experienced, right? Um, you can't necessarily count on that sewer line or that water line being where it looked like it was on paper. Um, it's it's a little bit less reliable here than it than it has been in other communities that we um, A little bit like the Wild West. So, um, how long the government will 
um, how local government can help. Um, was the other thing you just wanted me to talk about a bit. And so um, gap funding, and that, that's really simply, it costs X to build something or to buy, renovate something. Uh, and and the, the consumer can afford 20% less than that or 30% less than that. And so that difference has to really be made up with either a grant or a, for, a forgivable loan or a deferred loan that doesn't require payment maybe ever, but for sure not for a long time. Um, you can play with interest rates and, and different things, but if you don't really bring the price of the cost down significantly, it doesn't actually get to a spot where folks can afford it. Um, Site prepping for developers is a big piece. IRRRB has done some of that, but I think you know to take as much of that risk away um, from from someone who's going to take the risk that Chris had talked about. Um, and then I think you know there we don't yet know exactly how the, <laughs> the, the how, how the next project we might do is going to be financed from a debt perspective. But the first one that we did was a, a county bond, and grateful for the. The commitment and the resources, but also it, it costs almost as much as a tax benefit project to, to lawyer that loan. And, and we've just got to be able to do things much more efficiently and, and to have, have there be a higher degree of benefit for the project being affordable and not, not being folks like our attorney to make that happen. So that's that's kind of our, our mantra. Uh, you know, that's why we do what we do. So. That's what we got. Thank you. Yeah, was I close to picture? Yeah, it's great. Perfect. Okay, so you could have ignored me for the first 20 minutes and then heard that and then a lot of the same thing. Um, we're going to do a group exercise because I know it's because the sun goes down and say, okay, send me um, so we're gonna. I'm gonna ask you quickly, uh, and this is the time if you need to reserve some quick or, or stand up and get a snack to get that glucose. Um, Break into small groups, preferably near you, three to four people. The objective here again is for us to gain some feedback from you folks. Okay. Um, so select somebody to quick that's going to write it down and somebody who's going to report back. And this isn't going to take a ton of time, but there are five questions in about 10 minutes that I'd like to answer. I'm going to be a taskmaster here. And over time, you're done. Um, question one How many people in your group had trouble finding housing in Cook County? I wouldn't be surprised if it's not everyone. Question two, what is the range of time of people in your group have lived in Cook County? So for example, June, I closed, two and a half months. Someone's been here for 40 years, range, two and a half to four years. Um, how many people in your in your group live full-time in Cook County? Just an idea of the, the mix we have. What housing need that we've covered so far, especially with regard to the uh, EDA study, what need surprises you the most? And then finally, what type of housing do you currently or will you probably need or want in the future? Okay, you have 10 minutes, go. Uh, I think this is easy, we all live there. so I for me so just so what and then 
but yeah, it's like that was not okay I <laughs> Five minutes. Thank you. 
Well, it's depending on finance for This is not fun. It's getting. Um, sorry to interrupt. I just want to make sure to respect time to folks and keep us on track here. Uh, sounds like that's a good conversation. Okay, so you were supposed to select the recorder reporter. So I'm just going to work my way clockwise. Start with Canada Company. Let's hear what's the know. All right, so uh, we had a group of four and Three people came here long ago and had no struggle with housing. 
one person who came in 2011 did start the process. That was, think about it, 2011. Yeah, wow. Um, range of time people have lived here. Our group ranged from 1984 to 2011, arriving in Japan. So quite a bit of diversity there. And all of our group are here full time. So, yeah. Terrific. Yeah. Thank you. By the way, I am going to again collect these. Yep. Oh, really? So, yeah, do you have anything you want to scratch out? <laughs> <laughs> The part about Jason Gale. <laughs> but yeah, if you want to sit down there, take it out. Okay. Um, thank you. Next group. And then... You want us to finish? We oh, I'm sorry. Up. Oh, I, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> That's okay. Please. So housing um needs that surprised us that just the difference between the income and what housing costs. That's seven point six percent just blew all of us away. And as far as type of housing, workforce and middle income housing, what belt was needed, and housing that accommodates pets, because we know a lot of people only have pets. I have been promising all the developers I work with yeah. think about pets and storage. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So we are, are a group of three, and only one of us had a um, struggle finding housing. <laughs> and we have collectively been here between two and 20 years. Um, for what company needs surprise you most? One answer was none because, um, um, and then the how big. The gap between income and affordable housing is and the cost of um, developing a piece of property that we can use in the structure and the outside of the city. Mm -hmm. Housing and housing <coughs> Oh, okay. So <coughs> assisted living or senior housing, um, a place for children so that you can stay and grow in the community once they are of okay. To have a house and then uh, safer driveway access to a <laughs> <laughs> read the other side. Yeah, read the other side. <laughs> <laughs> Certificate of real estate value. Okay. Well, ARD. No, it's got it. Um, thank you. Lawrence. Uh, we're, we're a group of three people. Uh, no one uh, in the group had trouble finding housing. Uh, the group. Um, the length of time uh, in the county range from two months to 35 years. Uh, two of the three are full time. Uh, there are no surprises. I've been looking at our group because um, one person is an excavator builder in, in the county, and the other person is the wife of the executive director. <laughs> <laughs> so there were no surprises. In fact, rumor has it that uh, Jason practiced that part of the presentation. I don't <laughs> Um, the type of housing that we would like, uh, either need or would like in the future is one, uh, the three different answers. One is that we can age in place. Uh, the other is multi-bedroom, single-family home, and the third one is downsize. So something to move into and be able to sell your home at a company with downsides. Yeah, downsizing size. Once Great. the kids are gone, you don't need to see. Thank you. <coughs> Back corner. Hello. Um, we have uh, two that had trouble, two that did not. We have one in our group that has lived here for 59 years, but we're kind of an eclectic group. And one of us has lived 20 out of 40 here. One lived 20, took a break, and had two. And then one lived, <laughs> one lived 23, took a 30 year break, and is back for now. So we're kind of they're called recidivists. That's good. I have to tell you, what is it? How many living for counting? All of us time. And um, we were surprised by the increase in the two. And we said uh, senior housing because. We all just figured that we would need to leave, and we all really like the Homestead model, I would say. Sure. 
Um, and Mary and I are going to build something really beautiful on each end and lock our doors and then come in and have party space in the party space. <laughs> and is going to build that for us. Yeah. So. <laughs> Great. My work is done. Go ahead. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. These three were slackers and talk about irrelevant things. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. They're not from Cook Cut. For those of you who can't see, they're not from Cook Okay, thank you again. This is going to actually inform some things. Um, we're going to keep cruising, maybe. Mm. How does he do that? He's stuck. He just escaped. Just go off memory. Okay, great. That's going to go really well. Yeah, why doesn't she share? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I hope you got the charts memorized. Um, <laughs> oh, having a Jeff, you're late. Having a therapist for a while is really helpful. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to cover a few things that I mentioned at the beginning. Some some things to consider. Uh, so we've been talking about past and present, and these are just things that are on my brain. It's not everything. Thank God. Um, but some things in my brain as we're thinking about what does Cook County need in the future. So, um, chart on the left from our friends at the demographer's office at the state, just highlighting the bottom right corner. The projection was in 10 years from now, basically 2033, that's the amount of uh, folks, the increase in people from 75 plus. So, why does that matter? A few reasons. Um, one, uh, in 10 years, that means in 10 years from now, more or less, uh, over half the county will be non working age which is not insignificant mm -hmm. uh, for, for one major reason, the non-working folks typically need more services in various areas. So whether it's childcare, daycare, teachers, and then as you get um, past retirement, about 40% of your healthcare needs past retirement. So what does that mean for housing? Well, um, if you like having a hospital, and I brought the example up earlier about the struggles that they're having with staffing. Uh, if we don't find people to work in those positions now, Imagine as our population has additional healthcare needs, it means one of two things, people either have to be really healthy and stay healthy, uh, which a lot of that is out of our control, um, or they have to leave. If those are the two conundrums we run into. So again, I'm not, a, I'm not trying to be a doomsday. This is just data that I don't like, but it's real. Uh, we have some challenges ahead to catch up with what we need and also be thinking about folks who want to continue and, and I heard the age in place um, a phrase used to uh, become more and more common and popular because you know, people are able to stay in the home they love and the communities they love. So we have some more. Okay. Um, I talked a little bit ago, while ago now, about this chart. Green line on the right here is construction spending, the amount of money spent, and orange line is employment in the construction trades. This is from the uh, Association of uh, Associated Builders and Contractors of America. It's a big contract. Um, interestingly, not surprisingly, like I mentioned, you get to the recession, oh, plummet. So money goes down, jobs fall. Not surprising. What is interesting is it took several years for it to start creeping back up. And then when we look at the orange line, when you get to 2020, spring of 2020, boom. Again, I mentioned that too. Uh, jobs shut down, everybody paused, they weren't sure about certainty, what's going to happen. Again, the whole world was like, what do we do? Uh, it has since started to creep back up. But I drew a, I actually took a line and I drew it across the graph here. The right before 2020, or right before the, uh, since the recession, so many big events uh, in 2004. Right before the pandemic hit, it was just about to catch up to pre recession levels. And then it did. And so the projection is, barring some other crazy thing, and who knows, the last two years, um, the spending will continue to go up and the need for construction contract workers will need to go up. So they project that we already need about 650,000 additional construction workforce to pitch. Uh, that's nationwide, that's a lot. Um, on top of that, the latest statistic I read, and then, you know, there's a margin of error, even if it's a margin of error of a million, there's, we need about 5 million housing units across the country. To catch up, remember I mentioned that 20, 2007 to 2014, that pent up demand, we still have not caught up from that. And by the way, that demand exists, also new demand from population that is continuing to age. So it's not like we just have to catch up with that seven years. We have to catch up and then continue to build for the normal cycle of demand. Um, what's that? 
Right. <laughs> right. That's why we're here, right? Right. Um, so I was on a, a webinar conference call with Senator Carla Nelson, and she brought the staff that Minnesota needs 300,000 units by 2030. Um, and in Cook County, we can extrapolate. We just saw we need 50, what, 500 to 600 in the next four years based on our best project. Where do we build housing? We're going to try to cruise through this. This is a tough question. So I think Chris or somebody had mentioned how much land is there in Cook County. There's a bunch of land in Cook County. Oh, sorry, I'm in the way. I have to There's a bunch of land in Cook County. Most of it, it's not available. 91, 92%, depending on who you ask. Over 90% is US Forest Service, DNR, federal land. Okay. Okay, that leaves us, let's just be conservative. That leaves us 10%. Great. Federal, water, swamp, uh, slope. Okay, so we're starting to narrow it down. Um, on top of all of that, because that's not up, uh, we also have to think realistically, where do you build housing? You build housing where they get closer to amenities, you build them near infrastructure. It's way more cost prohibitive to build a new road and run new electric and new internet to a new place. So the, the picture on the right, actually, I think this is very pleasant. The greenish light color, that is where fiber or broadband exists in the county. That's remarkable. Considering we have 5,600 people, that's a lot of ground to cover. Um, which today, I think it's very easy to argue and hard to argue against the fact that internet is infrastructure. If you don't have internet, you're out of the game for so many things. That's a national conversation, state conversation, it's a local conversation. So, where do you build? Well, the intuitive places to build are where there's already existing infrastructure that has capacity. By the way, infrastructure here is very different from, like, Duluth, for example, in Minneapolis. We don't have natural gas. We don't have utilities as sewer and water outside of Grand Prairie. So the lion's share of the county infrastructure means like everything. You need to build everything. Um, so if you already have to build a SSTS subsurface treatment system and a well and an electric, you want to get as many of these boxes checked on the front end, right? So you don't want to have to add to it. You already have 50 grand before you put a slab on the ground, not to mention land cost. So when we think about trying to build uh, affordably, density. And I think I have that on the next slide. Yeah, greater density. It costs the same for a driveway for one house as it does for 20 houses to get into a property. Mm -hmm. So the more units you can do, the more you can amortize the cost of certain things among those units, right? Again, math. It all comes down to math. I used to like math, but I'm certain I'm not like math. Um, <laughs> so the, oh, yeah, the, the picture on the left here, that just is a visualization if you can kind of make out the colors. Uh, green, orange, yellow, or public owned land. Uh, the orange is the uh, reservation, the Grand Park Reservation. White is public or private. So, so you can see the white parcels, that's the private land again. So you take that, you map on infrastructure availability, you map on distance from amenities, because by the way, it's not just it's not just available land like the bullets say up, up here. Um, you can't, let's say you had the money, the land, and infrastructure to build 50 miles of the trail. And you would never build a hundred meter park. Why? Because then EMS, healthcare systems, schools, then you're talking about that many more people that need services way out. It doesn't make sense. Which is why most of the developments happen within 10 miles of the lakeshore place. That's one reason. There's a main corridor, easy access to things. Think about plowing, all the things you have to do, all the recreational homes that are seasonal out in the outlying county. It's part of the reason. It's way more difficult to get all those services. So that's just the reality of living in a beautiful rural community. Okay, I had to mention this because we talked about new construction. And I think, again, I'd probably say this until I'm blue in the face or get, uh, or we finish anyway. Uh, the only way out of this is to build our way out. The only way out of this problem. Either that, or there's significant market change that we want to need. And again, 30 to 100 years is apparently how long this is talked about Cook County. So I don't see that changing anytime soon. Um, but I also had to mention the, the obvious, most cost-effective, often cost-effective, environmentally conscious option is to save the housing you have. So it is way better to fix an envelope and make sure that house, because I view housing as infrastructure, as an asset to the community. I mean, clearly, uh, we don't have enough of that infrastructure in the county. If you can save one house, that saves you from scraping, landfill, redoing, like, all of the costs associated, like forget about even the, the truck traffic on the roads to bring all the materials, all of those things compound. Mm -hmm. So the best thing you could do is save existing housing, which is why we've been exploring as a board and 
about rehab needs. And so this, this chart at the left, uh, there was a survey, this is 70, 77 people responded to the surveys, four of them skipped this. But you can see in the bottom left, if you can make that out, I asked how, like, what is the level of need? Like how much cost would you anticipate for the, the rehab needs in your home? And by the way, I was explicit in the survey if you, for those of you who didn't see it. We're not talking about, I want a new granite countertop or jacuzzi type of stuff. We're talking about envelope longevity items, windows, siding, insulation, that kind of thing. Most of them, over 50% said it's going to cost more than $25,000, right? And, and this is varying needs. Like, so you're, like any given, any given person would be like, yeah, I've got to get a new roof. That's, you can do one thing, uh, much less windows if you get them. So I just want to, I, I, would be, I would be remiss to not mention that there is an opportunity. Chris mentioned this when we were talking about the project he rehab, that six unit. We have some of those in this community. You should take a hard look at that and figure out, hey, is that an opportunity? Really? But it's already structured, there's plumbing, we can change some of it. But that's way more cost effective than building out. Okay, market uncertainties. I'm not going to cover this a lot. Suffice it to say, the last two years have been a wild ride. Um, I think they're going to continue to be a wild ride. Uh, so something happens, the calculus change. You know, you change the facts, I change my answer. Um, so having said that, Will the trend go up or continue with the second home and, and fiber internet access push? I don't know. It seems like there's there are markets across the city, uh, across, the, across the country right now, uh, Boise, Phoenix, Miami, other markets that blew up during COVID, that now they have a bunch of vacancies. They're going to have some challenges or prices are going down. So what I've been keeping a very close eye on, on Cook County, that hasn't happened yet, but in part because we just don't have the inventory. Like that's not, there was no big boom here. So it wasn't the building boom, there was the buying boom. Um, if trends continue, we're going to need more housing, right? But I just, that's basically my big asterisk. I'm like, all of the need could change if something crazy happens. Okay, we're almost done. Independent exercise. This should only take a couple minutes. If you could just write down answers to these questions, I'm going to read them out to the folks. Well, they can see it. It's great. Um, where do you want to see housing most built? Now that you know, like, this is what we think about how, where, and where we should build housing. Where should we be building it? <laughs> what type of housing do you think the HRA should focus on? We had to choose something. I'd like to focus on bunch, but there's one of me. Um, what type of housing are you most interested in for yourself or your family? And then finally, how did hearing from both Jeff and Warnruff and Chris Skildum, how did that change your perspective on the cost? And we talked about that a little bit in the group cycle, was surprising, but has that, would that surprise you at all, hearing from them about who's on the ground? Please go. Just five minutes.
two minutes. This will be great on the curve. <laughs> Signatures, please. Yes, <laughs> no, no, <laughs> 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 Okay, good, good. Thank you. Again, I'm going to collect those when we're done. We are in the final stretch. Just a couple more minutes left. We're just going to do a quick summary. You can skip QA. Yeah, it's fine. You have to go. Go. Do you have questions? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we're almost done. Um, <laughs> quick notes. We need a housing of all kinds for all of them. Um, we have a lot of vacant homes that are used as second homes. I only mention that to say, we have housing infrastructure that's being used, it could be better used, or maybe maximum used. There are programs we can think about, and communities have done them. We'll leave it at that. Construction costs are high. Um, it's, I think you've we've established that it's impossible to do something that is affordable to the median household here unless you just shrink it significantly. Um, life is getting more expensive everywhere. I didn't even talk about like the inflation from COVID. Um, that's like the last couple of months, and then the last few months. So. That's a whole other thing. Um, Cook County started building. We're competing for talent. It will be. That's the other thing. That's not. I'm trying to think of like. Yes, that's been an issue here for a while. That's going to be an issue. Which housing is an intimate interaction with. The county is aging and will continue to do so. Which means not only are we housing for folks as they're aging, we need people to help provide services. Uh, why should you care? Well, you're all here, so I'm sure you care for some reason. But if you didn't have reasons, here's five, six, six reasons. Housing for your kids, your grandkids, housing for your future self. Uh, you like having local businesses because they need employees to work there. And if they can't afford to live here, they go. Uh, we are so lucky to have like visa programs through Cook County. It's remarkable. I know I've talked to several business owners, they would not be open if they didn't have visa programs. Um, you want to keep your business open. So that's the other side of it. You actually like growing your business. Uh, you want access to health care and you don't like tax increases. So the last one I'll just mention. Um, so I used to be a property tax assessor. This is very confusing for a lot of folks. Because it is confusing. Um, point is county passes a levy, there's a pie, think of it. There's a pie of money. County passes a year. Okay. If you get more properties and more tax base and the levy doesn't increase, your share of the pie gets smaller. So to the extent that we increase the number of housing units or businesses or whatever taxable entities in the county, the pie gets smaller. Okay. Or the county spends more. Yeah, well, just, just only if the levy increases. I was playing a very unlikely situation in which the levy stays the same for all the time. Um, what can you do? Uh, what can the HRA do, I should say? Public-private partnerships, huge deal. It's kind of a buzzword. The point is entities like the county and the city and, and the HRA work together to help private developers. Like Chris and Jeff were both talking about, it, it just doesn't, the math does not work. This is not a secret. That's reality. Um, this is something that I used to get hung up all the time in Duluth with folks. Work with developers. Again, I was talking about the best investment is in existing businesses. This is a controversial statement, maybe. Um, we want them to make money because then they continue to build. If Chris were to do all of the projects he did and lose on all of the rent, he would be out of business and we would have no builders. I'm not saying make uh, you know, hand over fist laughing to the bank. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm saying being a viable business that can continue to build what we need. That's something we want. And be surprised how many people would say, like, no, as soon as the developers involved, no, evil big, you know, rich developer. Um, like Chris talked about risk. There's a lot of risk. He put his company up. That's anyway. Um, the other thing is broker facilitate creative par partnerships and opportunities. There are a bunch of resources and partners that are doing things. And figuring out how we can connect with those, that's one thing we need to do. Is to try to bring them here. 
What can you do? Lots of things. You could sell or donate vacant land if you have it. If you have it, please sell it, build on it, something. Um, consider building uh, in the county. Build a new rental property. There are a lot of folks in, in the county who want to participate in Thomas Howe. Build an ADU. <coughs> But I was shorthand at um, accessory dwelling unit. City of Grand Rapids in particular has some great new zoning that allows for ADU citywide. It's actually, we did progressive zoning for a few years. We're very impressed with the ordinance. Point is, you can build a small 500, 600 square foot building on your property. Utilities and driveway are already in. Um, I'm not going to say every property. You have to look and make sure the setbacks are public. All that. Point is, it's an option. It creates alternate revenue streams for folks. Maybe it's a good retirement thing. Consider it. Um, gifts or grants. I've been working with some folks in the past uh, who explicitly contact me and said, we want to contribute. Like we have a foundation and we have an interest in contributing to this housing problem because they see the writing on the wall. We aren't going to continue to love this place like we do if we don't solve the problem. Because the things that we enjoy, take maybe for granted, maybe not for granted, will go away. Uh, and I only want the bottom one because that's free. Just as projects come up, um, I can tell you, you all probably know this, the NIMBY, you remember the word NIMBY? Oh, yeah. Okay. It's alive and well. Um, and I get it. I'm um, a YIMPY. You're a YIMPY. Yes, I'm a, oh, yes. You're a <laughs> um, the point is, as projects come up, there's no perfect project. Uh, we're at a position of, I'm not saying, that doesn't mean rubber stamping everything at least my way or I mean, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying there's a smart way to do it. And when the projects come, if they're if they're win-win for the community and for this developer, that's a big deal. Okay, that's it. Wow, eight o'clock almost. We had like thirty seconds left. Yes. So we have some land, and there's covenants on our title that inhibit us from building anything that's not listed. Oh, interesting. Yep. So that's not a problem. Um, so we have submitted a country rich, and um, we have a little cabin on it. The pride is the electric pride, but because of the covenant on our land, we are only going to rent it. No. So I'm, when I'm considering, I mean, and it's not rented, we would like to invest in the rental yeah. but uh, maybe buy some of the dwelling at this time. But, you know, is there any, anybody talking about how we can address that? You know, is it, it's not the empty meeting anymore? <laughs> sure. you know, um, of, of those covenants, and, you know, maybe there's some variances that could be applied for. I think I was telling my husband, people are to see council and say, you want to buy long term rental housing. And people are like, no, I'm like, really? <laughs> you know, so um, just curious if that's something that's been brought up. Yeah, uh, not that particular instance, but covenants are not usually regulated by the jurisdiction. Covenants are a title problem. Okay. So, so in your particular instance, the county isn't has no say over the covenants under the title. Right. That becomes a legal question, and right. you have to like look at the covenants and you apply the covenants. It's yep. an HOA thing. Um, we we applied to those attorneys. Oh, right. Oh, but, but he said that it's like it's come down to who enforces it. We don't want to be those people who are like sue us. You know, I mean, like we. Don't no, I wouldn't. Like, I can't like, recommend you doing that. No. Um, <laughs> you know, we want to be. We don't want to be anything that makes anybody mad. We also want to make sure that we're we're. Respecting the, the parcels because all these park members have parcel out the roof of these that covenants. Covenant. Everyone knows the same covenant. I, I don't know about everyone, but I know that this particular parcel of like 40 acres was parcel out in like five to 10 acre spots. Oh, so it's a new plat that had on the covenant, the plat had a covenant. That that yeah, yeah, I don't know. And so it's until 2027. And so we have first started like we just made it out and we're going to try to like build it That's up. Interesting. Yeah, so just curious if this is coming out for other people. Uh, no, this is the first time hearing about this particular okay. some other sorts of homes that share the yeah, property owners in your area. Oh, well, sure. I mean, we could do that. I just sold by the same person. Right. Same for sure. I mean, it's, it's, it's more or less like you can't, it has to be fully set. So I just just curious if this is come up, if there's any advice other than by talking to other attorneys and figuring it out. That's more advice, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. And I'm not interested. I mean, yeah, if it was something that the local jurisdiction could have influence over, then that'd be something that I would. Like, so like, yeah, we did that. Covenants so can be removed through the process. Yeah. So that's okay. the, the only way that I know it is to go through that legal process of getting consent to it. Any other? Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, any other questions? The folks in the chat and online are going to email me and say, give my email address, you're going to send me an email. Get back to them. Lawrence, you you talked about the the city. Uh, what was that? Uh, the small dwelling the city changed their zoning for accessory dwelling units. Yeah. yeah. 
the my understanding of the county zoning is that you can only have two living units per parcel. Are we are we changing that? Are we working on that? Uh, working on yes, changing it. Yeah. Okay. It's a conversation. Um, yeah, because you can imagine, let's say that there's 40 units, and that's one parcel. You can subdivide it. So that's the that's the short answer. But I want to say the quick way around it. If yeah, the zone district can demand a lot, let's say it's 10 acres per house, you subdivide it four times, then you could have theoretically eight times. But that doesn't, it always work that way, usually because of how it's made out to access. Yeah. So, um, yes, uh, I'm going to be meeting with the administrator and um, the land service is supposed to talk about some kinds of changes to the ordinance to allow for more. Like cluster homes. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Because it preserves the just quick for those of you who don't know cluster homes, it's basically taking the homes and building them closer together. Uh, and you can still preserve the property. So character, you're not you're not over densifying certain neighborhoods. You're just instead of spreading it out among 40 acres, you're leaving the back 30 and you're focusing 10 per team. So same number of units. Yeah. In my opinion, with the number of houses that we're going to build, that we need to build, uh, cluster housing is the only way to do that and still maintain the forest plot characteristic of the town. If we, if we start chopping everything up into five acres, everybody's got a driveway, everybody's got a mailbox, everybody's got a well on a septic, and it's going to really ruin it. Well, it's more expensive. Yeah, it's more expensive. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. It makes no sense. So but we need to change that that kind of zoning. It's, uh, it's in my notebook several times. <laughs> we need to call cousin Guido. <laughs> We're not there yet, Lawrence. Okay, let me know. know. Let me know. Yeah, thanks. Right. Appreciate that. <laughs> Any, <laughs> anybody else? Yes. Yeah. You think the staff between tonight and next Thursday night, uh, Chamber Connect, the program, the Q and A forum, we are going to talk about Zoom with Jason and Beth Cross, and it's at the beginning of the talk at five o'clock, and it'll last just an hour. Um, you can drink beer and eat tacos. You can drink beer and eat tacos. And I'm not doing this. So. housing. Yeah, yeah. Who doesn't want to talk about that? Thank, thank, thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What's the next one? What is building about these speculations now? I know it's more of a place. Scott, to me, you don't have a buyer lined up. How can this work? That means that Okay. I also put all packets on there. Yeah, of course you do. <laughs> She's not helpful. What kind of house do you want? I want a house with a garden. Here. Good luck. I'll let you build that. Yeah. It'll be great. Thanks for letting me practice on you. You did a good job. You did better. That's better than the living room. Oh, that was my second time. Yeah. 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 And you didn't talk too much. No, I said, no, I didn't. No, see, I think it was good. Yeah. 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 I'm trying to get a contractor so I have more 
well, the rest of that time, so we might be right there and well, to do this, pretty much if they do it well. So we, the radio person that I don't know is how to go. This one I've never had to. Turn it up, please. I'm going to volunteer. Yeah, it's playing time. Go for it. I just wondered. Like, it's a revive. Like, it's a revive. Like, it's a revive. Idea of how to make that happen, and that I know that our company needs to make seven million dollar notes. They're not. Yeah. So I think that the I think that there's a huge development. So when it's their asset, we don't get to do what the happening. I think we need to do that. So and if you're willing to pay them, yeah. Well, that's fair. Well, work on well actually, I thought, I thought about that, but I didn't have any place to put yeah. it. Right. <laughs> but no, thanks. Are you around tomorrow? Um, I am. I am. Yes. Yeah. 